Thanks for um, coming and participating in the Victorian e-commerce network. Um, this is our sixth event, I think. Um, and uh, today's focus will be on global payment systems. Um, so, um, firstly, I'd like to um, honor the traditional landowners, uh, past, present, and future. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's my great pleasure to uh, be emceeing this event uh, along with Victorian government. So, songs from um, uh, Victoria. S sorry, I'll, I'll get you to come and uh, s say the full, you know, name of the uh, department because it's, qu it's quite a handful. And uh, big thanks to Megan and James for. Um, uh, hosting this event uh, at PwC. So um, today we've got two fantastic speakers uh, to talk about uh, payment in uh, China uh, globally as well as Southeast Asia. Uh, so before we get started, I thought I'll set the context a little bit in terms of payment. Um, payment is such an essential, uh, important element uh, with e-commerce, with cross-border e-commerce in particular. Uh, when you look at a, a country like China, uh, Chinese Yuan, uh, the renminbi, is a uh, restricted currency. So uh, getting your um, funds through um, the purchase, repatriating that funds uh, isn't a, a simple task. So um, when you look at China domestically, payments actually are really mature and uh, a lot more advanced uh, than here in Australia. You can uh, walk around in large capital cities like Shanghai, Beijing for the whole day without your wallet, without credit card. And you can pretty much do everything through your mobile phone. Uh, but when you look at, um, you know, repatriating uh, your uh, sales, uh, backing Australia, the Australian dollar, uh, it's uh, more difficult than uh, you would imagine. Because uh, when you try to repatriate, you know, millions of dollars, you require special government approvals to uh, move that funds back into uh, Australia. And uh, when you um, want to, you um, um, uh, facilitate payment, you have to use, um, you know, a um, e-commerce uh, payment solution like Alipay or uh, WeChat Pay. Uh, and previously, it all had to be done in Chinese Yuan. Uh, now, uh, there is that capability in Australian dollar or US dollar, other currencies as well. So uh, it certainly is a very complex uh, area, um, but um, uh, we're now in a much better state than we were a few years ago, and uh, there are more mature platforms uh, available, and I'm sure AWOLUX would uh, talk a lot more about this. So uh, before uh, we invite the guest speakers up, I'd love to get Song on stage and talk about the Victoria e-commerce network for a bit. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, my name is Lei Song. I uh, came from Trade Victoria as uh, part of the Victorian state government. Um, the purpose, as uh, Roy mentioned, uh, we uh, just say, uh, create the uh, Victoria e-commerce network is to try to encourage uh, companies in Victoria um, to be involved in e-commerce area and try to share your knowledge or uh, experience how to deal in this market. So we're really happy today to have uh, Steve, Steve and uh, Rick come today to share their uh, knowledge and experience in the payment system area. Uh, that's a very um, high demand, um, hot topic in recent uh, months. Um, so we also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, PwC, uh, Megan's team in particular, uh, helping us to put these uh, events together. Uh, as we started the um, um, what we call the VN Victorian Ecoms Network, we always have the intention at the end of the day we want the company to uh, run this uh, event series in the future because that's really reflects who the company's uh, needs for what you want to hear or learn or share in this area. Uh, but uh, if you are you know, interested to know more about this uh, series, uh, you can check our website, uh, Trade Victoria, in the future. So thanks again for Roy and Market Engine's team to put their efforts together, make these things happen. Thank you. So uh, Trade Victoria has um, uh, quite numerous um, programs to help Victorian businesses to export. And uh, I'd like to point to um, Asia Gateway program in particular because um, it's a dollar to dollar matching um, you know, uh, incentive to uh, help Victorian businesses to um, export into China and uh, throughout the rest of Asia. And uh, you can use the uh, funds towards marketing services and various other things. So it's a fantastic initiative that Victorian government has put forward. So um, let's welcome uh, Stephen to the stage. Um, so I first 
came across Air Wallex uh, a couple of years ago um, at the top of Rialto at um, Inavu um, with the Minister for Small Business and Innovation, Philip Dalladakis, congratulating on the success that Air Wallex has in terms of raising uh, lots of money uh, in uh, getting their business uh, started. So uh, I'll let uh, Stephen tell us a little bit more about it. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, it's always a difficult thing when you when you have to speak about payments. It's especially difficult when you have to speak about payments at about eight thirty in the morning because <laughs> it's uh, probably not the sexiest and most interesting um, topic in the world. But I'll try my best. Um, if I go too fast or too slow, do let me know. I just want to make sure that we we get it. Um, Roy mentioned the China angle in this presentation. I deliberately have left it very global, not necessarily focusing on China, because the China specifics and the China cross-border payments is probably it's worth its own session almost because of the complexities. So I'll just sort of like um, quickly go. So when we talk about payments, we always have to sort of keep in mind that there is various sorts of payments. but. Looking at it from a country perspective, you either have domestic payments or you have cross-border international payments. So when we look at domestic payments, that's basically the simple, we have an Australian buyer who buys of an Australian seller. So money goes needs to go from the buyer to the seller, goods need to return. Very basic, you know, we do it in country, it is the same in every country in the world. Um, the easy part about this is, I am prepared to accept Australian dollars and as a seller, as a buyer, I do have Australian dollars. So it's very simple, very straightforward. Now, the mechanics underneath that is basically the money needs to go from one bank to the other bank, unless we be the same bank, but in most cases it transfer via banks. So the three core mechanisms we have is HH settlement, which is a net settlement. So it's called the automatic clearing house. Basically, the banks themselves, you know, I instruct my bank to debit my account. They will send a message to the other bank, credit their account, but they will not do that immediately. They will aggregate all those transactions together and then they will do a net settlement. And they say like at CBA, well, 20 people asked to credit $100 and for, with A and Z, they did business and there is, they need to pay $2,000. So it's actually net, net. So they just disperse the funds that way internally. RTGS is, I think for this forum, probably not as relevant. It is where you really do like big money transfers or when you buy a property. So if you ever bought a property, it's called real-time gross settlement. So basically, at that point, the banks do have accounts with the RBA. And as you buy the house, you transfer the money the money is immediately there. So your money is actually not in transit. So there is no credit risk there. And that's why people obviously when buying a house, they rather use the RTGS than the ACH, which takes T plus one. Some countries T plus two, T plus three. Um, the most interesting part and certainly the most relevant, I think for, for all businesses now and, and global is what we call faster payments. And in Australia, it's the NPP system which is really changing the whole payments landscape going forward. And it's really gonna become, I think the gold standard because it's happening in real time. And we see across the world, lots of countries, it started off in UK, um, Hong Kong, Singapore, Poland, the European Union, they all start to look at those systems. Australia is now coming in and is gradually rolling it out. North America is lagging a little bit behind, but that's gonna be the future. And the great benefit about this system is it's actually 24-7. So it runs from a Monday till a Monday. There's no stops during the weekends. So there's no cutoff times. So normally when you make a payment to the bank, they will say your funds need to be here by four o'clock. Otherwise, it will only be T plus two when the funds arrive with your counterparty. You can do just in time. So when you need to pay a bill, you don't need to make the calculation in your own head to say like, oh, wait a minute. If I need to pay my supplier by Friday, I need to initiate the payment on, mon on Wednesday for it to get there. So that helps you to do uh, far better working capital and supplier management. Um, credit risk, again, because the payment doesn't spend 
an awful lie in the, in, in the system, it allows you for faster movement of goods and services because your supplier will immediately see that the funds have been credited to their account. At the same time, from a seller perspective, you have the ability and access to your funds on the same day, which again helps you to improve your liquidity management. The good thing is it's immediate confirmation. So you send the message, you know exactly the payment has been accepted or rejected. Now the mechanisms of it work very simple. I am sending a payment. I instruct my bank to send a payment. What they will do, they will send the message to the counterparty to say, yes, Steve has $100. He will settle these funds. And then on the other side, my bank will reserve them. And on the other side, they will immediately credit that money into your account. At the end of the day, the banks amongst themselves will do like a major settlement. But from a consumer perspective or from a business perspective, you have immediate access to your funds. Fees, obviously, a key part of payments is very, very transparent. You know, when we look at an RTGS, we're looking at anything between $20 to $50, sometimes more. This is as low as $0.10, cents, $0.05, cents. we've seen them. So that's really going to help moving that traffic. And probably the final and, and most important part for companies and organizations to do an awful lot of payments. Um, at the moment, within the current clearing systems, and that's a typical thing around the world and a, sort of a hangover from uh, the 70s and the 80s when they developed the systems on, on, on massive mainframes and, and data was an expensive commodity. Uh, you had 18 characters or 12 characters to put in your reference. Now, if you do millions of transactions a year, 12 characters, you're going to run out quite quickly if you want to do automatic reconciliation. So lots of these people have now introduced um, the fields where you can put into 70 or 140 characters, which really helps to sort of transfer uh, funds. So that's that's on the domestic side. I think we all, we're all very familiar with it. Now we're going to go onto the cross-border side. Uh, the cross-border side is actually, it's got two steps in it. The first one is like, um, I've got Australian dollars and I want to buy goods in the UK. I can't give the person in the UK Australian dollars because they are, I have a good Australian dollar or bad Australian dollar is, you cannot use them in, in the UK. So we need to go to a, me a mechanism of making those Australian dollars into GBP. Once we have those GBPs, they still in Australia, we, didn't, we then need to find a mechanism to get them into the bank account right on the other side of the world. So that's sort of the second part. So before I go into a bit more detail, I'm just going to do very basics on FX. You know, on the FX side, and I don't know in Australia, there's conventions and you always have a base currency and a quote currency. Now the international standard for GBP, AUD, pound sterling against AUD, the base currency is the pound and the quote currency is AUD. Although I know from experience that lots of people are used to do it the other way around and when they talk about it. So, but simple logic is like for one pound, you get 1.75 Australian dollars. Now that was the rate when I made the, present, made the presentation last week. Uh, unfortunately, some economic data and headwinds out of America have come out. I think I need to update my presentation because that rate has now gone to, I think, about 180. So that means you, you have to pay $1.80 to get that same pound. But more on that uh, in a second. So who sets the exchange rate? So who is actually deciding that that's going to be the price for an Australian dollar? Well, it's very simple. I want to buy 10,000 pounds and I'm prepared to pay $17,500 for them. I go out on the market, and there's someone else who says, I want to buy, I want to sell 10,000 GBP and buy. And it agreed, the deal is done. So basically, the FX market is as simple as that. It is the most liquid market in the world. Literally trillions and trillions of dollars go through the system every day. It's, it's um, well, far more liquid than the, for instance, like everyone is familiar with the credit market, the mortgages. The FX market is, is far more liquid than that. It's also the biggest market. So and the way it works is like you've got these group of big banks in the middle. They like your wholesale banks. They have lots of these dollars, Swiss francs, Deutschmarks, pounds. And they have people who, who call out and they will have banks 
other local banks, might, might be NAB in Australia, or might be a big multinational who say like, okay, well, we need X, Y, Z dollars. They will make a quote, they will make a price, and they will transfer the dollars. So what does that say about the market? There is no central marketplace and no central source of pricing. Technically, everyone can make a price. As long as you have a buy for your, for your product, for your currency, uh, the deal can happen. So basically, that means that every, every FX deal is between two parties. So it's not like you have a central market. It's dealt on the way who will buy and who will sell. And the rate that you will receive will always depend on two things. It's basically the person who sells to you he will, in his price, take into account what he has paid for it or what he knows he can buy for it. And then the second part, and that's where the, the magic comes in, the margin. How much is he prepared to add or how greedy is he to sell you that dollar? So that's sort of like the very basics about the market. Now, before I go to the payment side, I just want to do a little story about Switzerland. Everyone is very familiar with Switzerland. I'm sure 2010, although uh, always a difficult one to use this example in uh, Australia when you talk about the GFC, because Australia doesn't seem to have failed the GFC at that point. But um, basically, the world economy was going in, in a massive recession, and people were looking for safe heavens. So when you talk about safe heavens and effects, people are going to buy dollars, they're going to buy gold. Now, things weren't turning out that well, the U.S. itself started to struggle. At that point, people decided, oh, we're not going to buy any longer U.S. dollars. We're going to start buying Swiss francs because Swiss safe little nations in the mountain, lots of reserves. Swiss National Bank was not happy with it. And that's where you have government intervention. And they said, we will keep a floor of 120. So every time the Swiss franc goes below that 120, we will buy. So... Hedge funds, eager to make a quick buck, obviously programmed their algorithms and their models to make sure every time the currency came close to that 120 mark, they would put the place, they would put a big order, price would go up, then they would sell it, they would make the money. Great, easy money. Obviously, the, pe the press picked up. By 2013, lots of retail traders were on the same game with less discipline, unfortunately. So what happens? 2014, Swiss National Bank owes about 45% of the GBP in your country, in your currency, which for a sovereign state is a far big, too big exposure. At the same time, we see things aren't running that well in Europe. We have the Greek um, financial crisis, the ECB themselves starting to do quantitative easing. So wait a minute, Switzerland, all of a sudden we have this asset, but this asset is quickly deteriorating. So what happens, they decide not to support that floor anymore. So rather than keeping up these high interest rates and paying, what they do, they actually make a negative interest rate. What does that mean? That everyone who holds Swiss francs, i.e. the big hedge funds at that point, need to start pay interest for the deposits they hold in the bank rather than receive interest. Speculators, retail speculators are very caught and aware and the net result is basically this. So this is a matter of hours. Lots of people lost their livelihoods in, in this situation where they actually had taken positions, um, didn't put in enough stop losses or cover and the prices dropped completely. So I think it's important when you do cross-border payments that you always are, always are aware about the underlying risk of currency. Because you might always think, yeah, it's going to be all right. So far, you might have been lucky, or there might have been a very low volatility, and you wouldn't have seen those price changes. But one day or another, at some point, you're going to be caught out. So be careful, because you don't want to be holding Swiss francs, uh, holding euros, if you need to pay in Swiss francs in this scenario. Because in a matter of minutes... It's going to, your bill is going to go up 20% just by the movement in the market and nothing else. So what we always try to do is as soon as you have any exposure and you bought goods, try to make sure you hedge them or try to make sure you buy the currency. That way you're not dependent on the currency movement. 
And don't assume that it will be okay, because in lots of these scenarios, people assume that they'll be okay and that the rate will recover. Well, we're now 2018, and I think the, the Swiss francs against the euro is still trading at 113. So you're still about 7% short. And if you think that is um, about six years ago, five years ago, it's, it's quite a bit of money there. So always be careful. Now, let's go to the interesting part, and that's where it really, really becomes a bit messy, which is cross borders. Um, on the right side, on the left side, you see the SWIFT, which is the SWIFT network. And basically, this is the network where all the banks are connected to. And SWIFT is a telecommunications network. It's something which was set up by the banks uh, back in the 70s. And what these people do, they send messages to the banks to say like, oh, I have someone who wants to sell something and he's going to give you that. They don't actually move the funds. They just facilitate the messages. And by the looks of it, it's a very lucrative business. So if I'm a payer here in Australia and I want to pay someone in the UK, what do I do? Well, I go to my bank. Let's go back and we, we keep it simple. So the exchange rate is 175. I've got a 17,500 AUD. So technically, I need to pay someone... 10,000 pounds, so I have enough if I have 17,500. I walk into my bank, the beautiful branch is a cup of coffee, I just lost $50. That's sort of the bank charges the privilege for you walking in. Then the bank says, okay, you've got 17,450, actually, because you already lost 50 just about this year walking in. The market rate, interbank market, when I said those big banks, they sell at 175. So the bank bought at 175, so they got $9,971. But wait a minute, the bank says, well, we haven't got our margin on here. We need to take a bit of this as well, because it's not fair. You know, the cup of coffee is one thing, we need to keep a, another bit of margin. So rather than 175, you get 177. So your 17,450 is actually only worth 9,859. Okay, so that's, you now have your pounds, you're ready to leave Australia. Now, most Australian banks do not actually have branches overseas. So if this person, the recipient, has a branch with Barclays, they need to go what you call a correspondent bank network. And that's sort of where they have agreements with these banks, say, okay, if I have to make payments into UK, I will use your bank. These guys are very happy with it, because along the line, they can charge a little fee. So they take their 20 pounds at that point, that correspondent bank might have another correspondent and take another 20 fee. So by the time it arrives with the recipient, what should have been 10,000 pounds is now down to 9,819 pounds. So actually, you need to pay $17,816 to make your 10,000 pounds. Sorry. So basically, if I get in front of it, so total fees and margin, £181 or $316 to make a $17,500 payment. And that's when you go via the International Correspondent Bank Network. Uh, a couple of years ago, when, when Jack started the business, he had to learn it the hard way. And this is sort of like, he, he didn't like fees, and I don't think many people like fees. So he started to think about how can we do this different, and that's when he started Air Wallox. Now, with Air Wallox, we do it slightly different. So... What we've done, I know at the beginning of the um, presentation, I mentioned about these faster payments and those real-time networks. We actually have created relationships with banks in all these countries. So we actually do have accounts with a bank in the UK where we can do faster payments. Obviously in Australia, we have it in North America, and we have it in Asia. So we actually don't need to go via the SWIFT network. So we don't need to pay those fees as we go along the journey. So starting point... 10,000 GBP. Basically, the interbank market is the same rate. It's 175. Now, what we do, we publish our rate as 175.50. And that's transparent. So depending on the deal we make with you, we will always say it will be the intermark rate, interbank rate, plus a certain commission or certain margin. In this case, it's 50 bips. Then, we charge you five fee, five dollars for the payment. So rather than the 50, the 20, and the 20, 
we have a very straight, transparent pricing fee. So total cost you $17,555 to do exactly the same payment. The difference is we do it in T0, T plus 2. If you look back at the previous slide, if you go via the SWIFT network, times can go vary anything from two to nine days, which is nine days your money is actually in the system and you don't really know because there's very limited transparency in that. So basically a savings of 261. So that's sort of the concept and, and the, ba the business that we have built. Um, obviously, lots of our business we do with China, but we also do inbound and outbound out of China and Australia to the rest of the world and vice versa. So we have international payments. We do same payments. It's full amount delivery. So when you send 10,000, 10,000 will receive on the other side of the world. We can do it at scale and it's a transparent pricing model. You will know exactly before you enter the transaction how much fees you're going to pay. From a raise perspective, they're live. You get the raise that you get at the wholesale market with the big banks. You don't need to go to the retail banks. And you can our platform is a single platform to do both the FX and the payout. So you log onto the platform, you put in your payment, it will automatically do the FX, and then you click yes or no to proceed with it. We also have local currency accounts. So for businesses who want to expand to the UK or North America or Europe, rather than having someone to go over there and open a bank account, we actually have agreements in bank, with banks overseas to open those accounts on your behalf. So you can then invoice your supplies in the local currency. They will pay in your bank account a week and then repatriate the funds to you in Australian dollars or if you have a US dollar or a euro account in Australia, we can bring them back in, in those currencies as well. From a pure integration perspective, we've got APIs, which is when you go at large scale, which is more from, from a banking infrastructure perspective, or we have a web app. So we basically go onto your website, we set you up with an account, and then you can start doing pay. We also, the China angle, because of our invested Tencent, we also do have WeChat activities. Now, the WeChat activities we do in Australia are more at a settlement level. So we're not doing so much a pound of sale, but we work for the big aggregators and do settlement on their behalf. That's in a nutshell, Air Wallets and cross-border payments. Thank you. So we do a lot of uh, cross-border e-commerce um, services and um, technology. Um, this is um, a fantastic example of, uh, I, I love the Swiss franc uh, example in particular. It's, um, it's a great illustration of how um, every step throughout the way you try to have control in your business, you know, from logistics, customer service, you know, product satisfaction. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're dealing with much larger platforms, you lose that control. And uh, global currency foreign exchange is a classic example of it. You anticipate certain percentage of margin, then suddenly with that loss of control, you lose um, quite a bit of margin in this. Um, so um, with the cross-border e-commerce uh, activities that we do from Australia, China is certainly a very important player. I'm glad to see WeChat Pay being a um, provider of um, um, a partner of yours. And uh, uh, also um, from Australia perspective, Southeast Asia is really important uh, from uh, our merchants perspective and the addressable market perspective and um, uh, to talk about that uh, Rick um, from uh, Trade Trade Indy uh, has got a lot of experience in Southeast Asia and love to uh, hear uh, what Rick has to say about that. So my name is Rick. Um, I am the operations director for Trade Indy. Um, Trade Indy is essentially an ind independent programmatic aid agency that's headquartered in Melbourne um, but with operations in Singapore, uh, KL, and Jakarta. Um, what do we have to do around, uh, what, do, what do we have to do about global pay payments? Not a lot, um, to tell you the truth, but um, we do have a lot of, um, we do run a lot of campaigns where we're accountable for the performance of that campaign, um, where we are accountable for the final transactions that the um, advertiser is expecting. Um, so we're an independent agency. We, we work with a lot of uh, independent um, advertisers and direct brands. We do the programmatic advertising for all the warehouses in Australia. 
Uh, by warehouses, I mean chemist warehouse and hair house warehouse. Um, so <laughs> that was a joke. Um, <laughs> Uh, we don't have pet warehouse though, but we are we are aiming that we have an aspiration to work with pet warehouse. Um, our responsibility is largely around performance uh, ad campaigns. So, like I said, this is our, our connection to to global payment systems and how we track the performance of ad campaigns um, to uh, to global payments. Um, so trends in the market. So. But like I said, advertisers uh, these days, they expect full accountability of, of campaigns. So we work very hard with our advertisers to really understand what the KPIs are and what they really want to achieve on that. At the end of the day, especially with our consumer brands and probably about 90% of our, the campaigns that we run and advertisers that we work with are consumer brands, they're looking for that transaction at the end of the day, whether that be a, a booking, a purchase, a form fill, it is some form of transaction with the consumer. Out of that 90% of campaigns, probably about 80% does involve some kind of financial transaction that we, we, have, to, we have to monitor and track. May not be responsible for, but very much have to track. Um, the other trend I, I kind of want to uh, tell you about in the market is that AI, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning um, in the industry, in the in parlance, it's you know people call it ML all the time. Uh, I had French guys talking to me about calling it ML. I thought ML was a person called Emil, but no, it's not. ML is machine learning. So I'm new to the to this kind of artificial intelligence and and machine learning area, um, but it is permeating every industry um, that you know of, um, and it's something that. Uh, is becoming cheaper and more accessible for even small businesses to take advantage of. Um, and then the other trend I want to talk about is digital marketing um, and tra transactions. They evolve for each market. Um, I said my experience um, is largely in Southeast Asia. We're based out of um, Singapore for 14 plus years. Um, worked a lot in, in, um, in Southeast Asian markets like uh, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand. Um, and the, the evolution of digital payments and transactions is very different for each of those markets. And I'll talk a little bit about how that is progressing in some of those markets. Um, so first trend, so advertisers will expect full accountability of campaigns. Um, when we kind of like map the, the evolution of digital advertising from 1994, to the, which was the first digital ad banner, um, that started annoying people on on desktop computers. To um, today, it has really in, uh, evolved to a very very accountable form of uh, marketing. Um, in 2000, when Google AdWords launched, it was really the first time of biddable biddable advertising, in which um, advertising inventory started becoming an auctionable. Thing in that you did it in real time, um, you know, advertisers bought and sold um, the, the advertising inventory. It started off with 300 advertisers when Google launched. People thought that they were crazy. They had big brands um, like P&G um, not, not participate and, and thought that this was a crazy idea to actually have to, you know, participate in an auction to buy for advertising. Now you take a you know um, you know ten uh, fifteen years later, it's become the norm of like biddable um, biddable advertising. Um, Two thousand seven that expanded to um, not just search words but now display advertising. Um, the other thing, obviously, that significantly happened in two thousand seven. Um, can anybody guess what that was or what I'm thinking about? It was the launch of the iPhone. So. Um, this obviously changed the nature of how people um, advertise, how people um, are accountable for some of their marketing campaigns. The fact that you know um, people were starting to do a lot more things um, with their phones um, with the launch of the iPhone. Yeah, it took one or two years or three years to, to evolve into a real transaction mach machine, um, but. 2007 was a significant uh, date for, for when that happened. Um, and then when you fast forward again to last year, 
we had a lot of scares, obviously, with the, the data breach um, scandals um, uh, from, what's that company's name? Cambridge Analytica. Yep, uh, that one. <laughs> I, I, I want to forget about that t- time period. Um, but there was a lot of sensitivities, a lot of issues around the use of um, or the misuse of data um, within those big ad platforms um, in Facebook, um, with Google and, and, and YouTube and, and, and with Twitter as well. Uh, a lot of that is obviously being, being cleaned up. Data is still available. We're obviously more focused on um, non-PII data, so non-personally identifiable um, data. But um, there are still good, safe, consumer-friendly ways to target audiences and and deliver ad campaigns that perform well uh, and, and again, in a brand safe and in a consumer-friendly way. Um, so the next trend I want to talk about is um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. That it'll perm- It's permeating through every industry and country. Um, when I think about our own um, industry of, um, of digital advertising um, and the start of how how it worked. It kind of was like this, like people trading um, the ads in, in, in this kind of manner, um, like a stock exchange, right? And if you think about the, the evolution of stock exchanges and how that works, uh, it's, it's more like, it became more like this in terms of terminals and automated trading and people like this. Um, it's now gone to a, a situation where it's more, you don't need as many people now to run stock exchanges or now ad campaigns in that it can now be a couple of guys at a desk in a cafe um, working multi-million dollar campaigns. And this is essentially us. I mean, this is not is essentially my team. Uh, this is, this is uh, I don't know, from Flickr. Um, but it's essentially like this. It's a couple of guys, uh, really, really smart and savvy, um, but they're using... What they are using is a lot of AI and machine learning that's obviously all in the cloud. Um, and this, in the last couple of years, this has become affordable uh, for even the small business. We're a small business and we have 20 people uh, in, our, in our company. Yes, we have offices around the world, but when I used to think about artificial intelligence and machine learning, you, know, you, you heard all the big things like, IBM Watson and and trying to big uh, you know trying to build a, a big supercomputer that would be uh, that would be, beat um, Kasparov is that his name the chess guy um, you know, yes it, there are those kind of big brain um, machines and AI that that, you, that, um, that still need to be built and learned but the AI and machine learning is all about the the, the chips and the and the, and the machines that now have become very, very super affordable um, and accessible for even the small business. So um, if you are a small business like us, you can access it you know, via Amazon, via, via Google, all in the cloud and you know, buying at a very, very cheap uh, rate, a very, very affordable rate. So guys like, guys like us can really start to compete very intelligently against some of our uh, our bigger ad agencies. Um, the way we used to do it um, when we used to buy advertising in terms of like specifically for, for our company is that we used to take a look at the exchange, we used to take a look at the ad advertising that we that we bought and we would score the, the inventory based on this. If this looks familiar for financial traders out there, it's very similar. Our, the guy who came up with this in our company was formerly a uh, financial derivatives trader. So he t- took a look at um, the ad inventory that we're buying and said, well, I can actually score this based on different parameters of the ad campaign. So things like being the publisher, like the website, um, the, the publisher like a Sydney Morning Herald, the exchange where I'm getting it from, like say Google Ad, ad Exchange, and other kind of parameters around that ad campaign, such as um, the geo, um, the geography that the that the that the user is from, any other kind of um, data points from about that user, such as such as age, um, such as such as gender. A lot of this is inferred, obviously, by where they're going to um, and, and and what site. Um, but then we we go through this in terms of um, scoring the 
the um, the, the the user and scoring um, how how likely we think they are they they go, they're going to um, transact or or execute within this within this campaign. So we used to do this offline. So we used to download all the data from from the ad campaign. We looked at it. We scored it. We we downloaded it into a into an Excel sheet. That obviously you know all that manual um, assessing took a lot of time. But now that what we do is that we we do this in real time. So if you think about it, when you look at your your mobile phone and you're looking on your on a site with on on your mobile phone, and you you're pulling up Sydney Morning Herald, the ads that are that are coming up there, they're all bidded and bought in real time. And what we've done with the machine learning is that we logically say, you know, once you download that page, that for instance, you know, whoever, like, you know, if you're downloading a, a page, sorry to point you out, but you did see in the front row, <laughs> um, you're worth $2 for, 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 um, for, look, for looking at that. And so, um, for whatever reason, because you work at PwC, because you know, sorry again, to, <laughs> you work at PwC. Yeah, you're 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 up early. You're on time to, to work, which is great. So you're obviously earning good money, um, and then so we'll give you a score of um, of ninety percent, and then we'll we'll, we'll bid more. Um, somebody you know outside or like you know at a at a different strange time, we may not bid as high. Um, so again, this is all done in real time. If we didn't have, you know, the AI accessible um, um, via, say, a Amazon or Google, this would not be possible for us. So um, this is just one example of how AI and machine learning is is working for a, for a company like us. Uh, we've applied it to an ad auction model, um, but if you think about it, you can apply it for everything as well. Um, I've seen companies use it for customer service. Um, if you think about virtual assistants, a lot of them are really terrible. Um, I, yeah, if, if you've ever used Singtel Optus as one, it is super terrible. Um, but it is a machine learning uh, algorithm that that is constantly improving. So I've seen the difference between you know when I first started using it to a year later, it has slightly improved. It's got my name right in those kind of what I what I like, what I don't like, what I'm looking for, um, but it is going to get better. Um, Hyperlocal performance. Um, another one around this. Another example I want to give you is um, hyperlocal performance ad campaigns and how machine learning is 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 doing that. Uh, and this is kind of partly um, related to how we how we're kind of connected to the to the um, payment systems. So we have a partnership with with Harcourts, um, the the real estate network, uh, where we drive hyper local campaigns um, for the real estate agents. Um, so if you see here, these are kind of a couple example of the ads that, that we that we run for them. Um, uh, very targeted. What's the difference um, that we do? So what we do is we take a look at. Um, uh, they have a they have a property that's um, that's for sale. Um, they've obviously got a list of uh, competitive properties in that region. So let's say Pakenham, um, and they've got a three bedroom uh, house listed for for one million. Uh, and there are there are similar properties in that region in that in that neighbourhood um, that are, they're going for the same that are open for inspection at the same. Uh, open for inspection in, uh, around the same uh, time frame, like say, like say a month. So if this is the house that um, the Harcourts is interested in selling, um, these are the um, other competitive houses. Um, they're open for ins inspections at certain times. Obviously, that that information is is very public uh, to to users. It's on it's on REA. It, it's everywhere. So what we do is that we monitor these houses. When users, punters, go to these houses for these open for inspection times, um, we we target them with the ads and say you could be interested in this in this house. The reason why um, these are all different shapes, not because I'm bad at PowerPoint, but um, we use polygons instead of radiuses, and and these are machine learned um, uh, polygons. The reason for that is that. 
uh, and again, this goes to very much our learning in, in Southeast Asia as well, is that when you target a house, when you target anything else, um, the other example that we use is convenience stores. If you target a house, if you target radius, this house, the, the, the neighborhood or the demographic can be very different across the road. So we map it very much according to the demographic that we're looking for. We work, our office is in St Kilda. If you go from one point, 100 metres across the road, 100 metres behind you, the demographic is super different. You can get people of similar demographics to you and very different people on the other side of the road. So um, you have to be very careful about a radius because sometimes radiuses don't work. So what we do is we map um, polygons, uh, all different shapes and sizes. The algorithm will start learning um, the, 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 the different natures of um, the neighbourhood. Real estate agents know their neighbourhood, good real estate agents know their neighbourhoods really well. So they'll, they help us kind of map these, these polygons and then the AI will learn it. So what this has to do with payments is that we use this same model. We, we're using this same idea to work with um, more consumer brands that want to map to their end transaction and, and, and hyper-local campaigns. So if you think about 7-Eleven, they want to you know, promote um, their $1 coffee plus $2 banana bread deal. Uh, again, we work with a convenience store and say, okay, if you want to target those guys, um, let's not just target 7-Eleven, let's target Coles Express, let's target uh, people who go there. Once they enter there, let's target them with their, the, the $1 coffee deal. And again, we, we talk about polygons, not, not radiuses. Um, there are tech vendors that offer this solution, uh, people like Factual and Mobile Walla um, that, are ba that are based here in Australia that can help you with learning this kind of, um, these le uh, learning these kind of algorithms. Uh, I'm just going to speed up a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about payment and services in Asia. Um, it's very different in each, in each market. And while there's, like, there's this great um, technology like AirWallox and like all these different things like mobile payments, um, they evolve very differently. So if you think about something like Gojek, which is a kind of like an Uber for, um, for Indonesia, um, they, they started as like the Uber for Indonesia where you get a motorcycle ride in, in Jakarta. <coughs> It takes you uh, anywhere. Order it like a like an Uber. What they've really evolved to is a logistics company that can solve all the problems for uh, all your different kind of life problems in in Indonesia. Um, if you ever lived in in Jakarta or if you ever been to Jakarta, traffic is a nightmare, and that's very consistent around all the major cities around uh, around Southeast Asia as well, apart from Singapore. Um, and so these guys have evolved to do. You could do. You can get these Gojek riders to do anything for you within reason, as long as you pay. But they will go and not only pick up food for you, like an Uber Eats, and deliver it, but pay your bills for you. Say, or if you need to get like a visa at the um, at the German embassy, Indonesian passports one of the hardest, more, most restricted passports. It's like a three-hour wait to say, you know, at, at the German embassy. You can pay a Gojek rider to sit in the queue for you for two hours, give you a call when you're needed to go up there and then you know, replace that, that rider. Um, you can make, make them book movie tickets for you, go to the cinema and, and, and get the movie tickets for you. So this is a, a Gojek rider can really be a, a warm body that kind of you know, is your doppelganger, can, you know, can, can fulfill some of your life, life solutions for you. Um, or accounts um, feature their feature their goods or what they're selling um, within their accounts um, but the interesting thing about that I mean that's relatively normal but what they do is that they actually complete the transaction within a messaging app 
So this one in particular is done in Line for, for Thailand because that's the most popular. In Indonesia, it's, it's WhatsApp. And for, for Malaysia, it'll be Facebook Messenger, for instance. But what they've done, what they'll promote is obviously their WhatsApp number or their Line number in, um, in their Instagram page or in their Facebook page. But if you see here, the transaction is actually done um, right there in, in Line. Um, it's done through the a, a bank transfer. They'll kind of say, you know, you need to transfer me this money. Give me a, a you know, give me proof of once you've done the transfer. This one is just a screenshot of the transfer that they've done, and they say, okay, I mean, this entire, um, it's been, it will be delivered to you the, the next day. So this is an example of like, while payments are, are, are great, people are already figuring out how to get the most or how to really transact um, through all different other means. And the ability to do this through messenger apps is really important in Southeast Asia. So like the idea of kind of WeChat uh, integration in there. Um, and this is very culturally acceptable in Southeast Asia. Um, it's, it's, it's coming to, to, write, uh, to be the norm. In other parts of Asia, you have to be very wary of the cultural sensitivities or the, or the norms as well. Um, in my previous job, I used to travel to uh, Japan a lot. Japan, iPhone is very popular, but interestingly enough, Apple Pay isn't. And what's worse is that Apple Pay via watch isn't. So when I used to go to Starbucks in, in, in Tokyo and I said, can I pay like that with my watch? It was a very rude gesture. I, I quickly realized <laughs> in Tokyo. So they don't, you know, Apple Pay just doesn't exist in, in Tokyo or in Japan yet, which is really interesting. But the cultural thing of like doing that <laughs> in um, Japan, obviously you have to be very sensitive about. Um, and so you do have to, you know, really adapt to the different cultural sensitivity, sensitivities and the way that people are, are you know, um, are currently doing doing transactions and doing commerce in, in Asia. Um, despite that, you know, um, my, my um, recommendations are to invest in, and, and, and partner with tech vendors um, who, who specialize in this, um, who specialize in, um, in, in, in targeting and reporting and, and tracking um, performance um, e-commerce uh, transactions. Um, like I said, uh, there's a couple, if you're interested in the hyper-local side of the, the business, there's guys like um, uh, Mobile Wallow and Factual who do that. Um, if considering Asia, consider each market individually. It's hard to have a blanket approach. Yes, you can work with one regional provider, um, but make sure that they know each individual market really well because it's very, very different. And they can get down to like what social network is most popular, what you know, what messenger platform is most popular in that market and get a sense of what you need to integrate with um, when you're thinking about your, 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 your payment solution there. Um, and the ecosystem is fully integrated. So you can't think of, I'll set up a website, I'll set up a, I'll set up a payment system. You have to think about, I need to set up my, my social presence. I need to figure out how that connects to e-commerce to the, to the payment side. Because you know, from, a, from a user's point of view, it's all integrated. Um, and invest in, in AI uh, and machine learning. Uh, my recommendations is more around, uh, it's a lot around automation. Um, we do a lot of automation at, at, at Trade Indie. Uh, it pays off in spades. And the other area I would, I would suggest, especially for e-commerce operators, is around virtual assistance. While the systems that you and the payment systems that you've created are great, there's always going to be issues and questions for users. Um, if you want your business to scale well, virtual assistants, while a, a little bit funny at the start, have started to improve a lot more where it's really worth it for you to look into and, and invest in more. I think that's it. Thank you. So who's got uh, questions for our speakers and perhaps myself as well in terms of payment? Global payment song. Thanks for Stephen and Rick's um, um, very informative presentation. I, I, I really learned a lot, particularly from the Air Wallex uh, model, how that works. I was just wondering for uh, Air uh, Wallex, a lot of the um, for the company in here, if they want to set up the uh, uh, cross-border uh, channel, 
uh, what ex- in from what extent Air Wallace can help them? Would you help them to start to build up the uh, established bank account or payment system online? Uh, what extent of service you can supply to them? As I alluded to in the presentation, we we have a web API. So basically, um, you can provide a form, you apply online um, with payments. Uh, the one difficult thing is you need to pass compliance. So you need to supply us with passports and business registration numbers, uh, which our compliance team will validate. Normally that takes about 24 to 48 hours. Once that is completed, we effectively open your account so you can then come onto the platform. Um, so then based on, on your trading needs, we will set up um, the currencies and the corridors uh, you want with certain limits and based from there on you can literally start making your payments to your suppliers or your whoever your customers you, you need to refund um, across the world basically um, if you would like to have the capability to have collect- collection capabilities so where you like to have an account in Europe, North America uh, or the UK again you go via the platform we will uh, give you what we call a virtual bank account, which is a local collection account. That's actually a fully operational bank account. So it works with the clearing systems in all of these countries. So you put that on top of your invoices. When they pay, that will come automatically into your wallet on the application. So you log in and you'll see X supplier has paid. This is the payment reference and this is the amount I received. Um, because you do the collection in, in local currency, at that point, you don't have any effects exposure or any effects loss because you received euros for euros. At that point, it's up to you. When do you want to repatriate your funds back to Australia? When you do so, again, you go into your wallet, you select, and it will give you a rate, and that will take for five seconds. And if you're not happy with the rate, you just cancel it, and you wait till a better time. If you're happy with the rate, you just cancel it, and then the funds would be within your account within the next couple of hours. Uh, when you sell online, sometimes um, you do get chargeback. Say um, you, you, you now have a chargeback. Can you use that as the example to to talk about your dispute process? Thank you. Chargebacks is always the biggest problem in the world. <laughs> Anyone who does commerce. Um, I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm the payments expert, the expert on, on chargebacks. So, um, but certainly with the team... We, we have worked with people where we support the chargeback processes. Uh, it's around having clear understanding with, with the e-commerce sites to see what is acceptable because obviously some of these have a limit in time. Um, I also think it's a very um, Southeast Asian thing, the whole chargeback model. It's really something like probably from a Western European perspective or Australian Asians. We, we're not so... Um, you know, used to but it's certainly something we support and it's again using the same payment channels but you use it in reverse and in, in reverse the other way around but it's, it's about having that agreement up front more than anything because we are just the infrastructure underneath it is what the uh, platform or the supply allows or what is acceptable as a chargeback so that's sort of like we we support the ecosystem we not sort of have have the magic bullets for it. it just it is what it is. Uh, talk, talking about chargebacks, actually sometimes considered as the cost of doing business for a lot of merchants. Sometimes people factoring, you know, a couple of percentage of margin for um, those considerations. Thank you. My name is Joro from Australia China Business Circle. So my question is about a uh, one day arrival. You know, when you talk about one day arrival, uh, for me, it's two different concepts. One day and arrival, right? One day means you guys are fast. Your your business have a uh, a strategy. I mean, advance on um, you know uh, speed. But for me, arrival means security, right? So for um, my question will be, so in crypto, you know, we have something called smart contracts. So what is what is the business model in your business to persuade a business partner to trust you? You know, by knowing that. It can be saved by using your business in small and big transactions. Sorry, uh, yeah, the first thing probably why people trust us is we don't use crypto or any of those currencies or blockchain. So we use the uh, traditional banking channels. So every all our funds are held in client segregated accounts. So they are the, the basically our customers' funds. 
Um, we use the traditional banking network, which has a full guarantee. Um, it, it's, it's fully visible. And if you use the faster payments, where you basically have one minute, or let's say in, in worst case, 10 minute execution time, it, it is quite transparent and people trust it. And yes, um, the way we do the onboarding with our customers, they go via the APR at the web service first, and they do a set of smaller payments to see the concept. Once they're comfortable, they go and they start to do the large transactions via the API. Um, it's fully secure and compliance with the banking regulations. We do full compliance checking. We do full screening. And I think that's the most important thing uh, for every business who, who does cross-border. Um, no disrespect, and crypto and, and blockchain has got a tremendous future. But at the moment, I think the regulatory environment is still not ready to accept it in its full capability. And when you make payments, the most important thing is about compliance, is to make sure when you pay someone in China or in Europe for goods, you actually effectively have bought those goods and there is an invoice attached to it. And that's what the banks where we work with across the region will all do the compliance. So we, we are part of a far, far bigger, far wider ecosystem. It's not Airbolex that just connects directly to the clearing we have everything in client segregated accounts, which obviously gives our customers more comfort that it's not just us putting it in a sock and then pulling it out of a sock somewhere else, but it's connected to the banking network. The only thing we do, and to the earlier point, we, we use machine learning to find the cheapest way to make that payment. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, this is all the time that we have for, uh, but I do encourage you guys to hang around and network and ask questions to our speakers, perhaps later uh, when the uh, networking session starts. So uh, can I get a round of applause for our speakers today? Rick and Steven. Thank you.